hate it, delay it? That's pretty much sums up Donald Trump's legal strategy right now. This week, the former president and his lawyers asked a federal judge to indefinitely postpone his trial over his mishandling of classified information. In their filing, they have the gall to argue that, quote, the case presents a serious challenge to both the fact and perception of our American democracy. American democracy. And they say that any trial during the presidential election will impact the outcome. Now, all of this is pretty ironic, considering the defendant here is under investigation for trying to literally overthrow a democratic election. But you don't have to be a lawyer to see through their argument. If the trial is delayed until after the election and Trump wins, he could try to use the presidency as a shield from justice, either by directing his own attorney general to dismiss his case or by trying to pardon himself. And his team isn't even really hiding it. The New York Times reported that some of Trump's advisors have privately said, quote, he is looking to win to winning the election as a solution to his legal problems, saying the quiet part out loud in meetings there. There we have it. Special counsel Jack Smith isn't exactly falling for the delay tactics. He responded to the request by stating that there is, quote, no basis in law or fact to grant this motion. But the decision is not exactly up to him. It's in the hands of Trump appointed judge Aileen Cannon. And it certainly sounds like Trump is counting on her to do his bidding. Here he is in an interview just this morning. Do you have any indication the judge will grant this motion? I don't know. I know it's a very highly respected judge, a very smart judge, and a very strong judge. Well, you appointed her. I did, and I'm very proud to have appointed her. But she's very smart and very strong and loves our country. I mean, loves our country. We need judges that love our country so they do the right thing. Subtle. It's very subtle there, Mr. Trump. Meanwhile, as Donald Trump attempts to fend off the documents trial, the special counsel's prosecutors could be nearing an indictment in their investigation of January 6th. We learned this week that Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, recently testified before a federal grand jury in that case. According to the New York Times, Kushner and other close aides were asked whether Trump privately acknowledged that he lost the 2020 election. In lawyer speak, it suggests they're trying to show corrupt intent, that Trump's efforts were knowingly based on a lie because he already knew he lost. Few people are as familiar with Trump's scheme to overturn the election as Congressman Jamie Raskin. He was in the Capitol on January 6th, led the impeachment trial, and was part of a congressional investigation into the attack. I sat down with him at his home this week to discuss this case and all of the legal troubles facing the former president. I want to start with the special counsel's investigation into January 6th because there was some news this week. The New York Times is reporting that prosecutors have questioned multiple witnesses in recent weeks, including Jared Kushner. What does that indicate to you about where they are in the investigation and what charges it may bring? It seems like they're zeroing in on the question of what exactly Donald Trump knew and what he believed. Um, there were a lot of indications we got during the January 6th hearings that he knew he had lost the election. And um, if they can nail that down with some witnesses, that will solidify um, his um, culpable intent. Yeah, Jared Kushner said he didn't know he lost, it seems, in the reporting, uh, which seems to me, or yeah. that sounds like you're a, you're a little skeptical. Of well, that. Cassidy Hutchinson told us that he, he said, can you believe I lost to this guy? Um, so when he was behind the scenes, it was perfectly clear. There, there are also a series of administrative steps that he took for the government indicating that he knew that there was going to be a succession of power. Um, and he knew it was really over while he was saying on the other side to the mob, you know, we're going to stop this and, um, you know, we're going to reclaim it and so on. What unanswered questions do you have from the investigation, given how deeply you yeah. were embedded in this? Uh, for special counsel Jack Smith that you hope he will answer? There are a number of uh, formal parts of the investigation that uh, I wish we had had more time and more resources to go after. For example, um, we knew that the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers were acting as... Okay, pick a door. Door A, you're getting ready to start a business and you go... Look as the front mind shock troops to attack the officers and to try to unleash the wrath of the mob against 
um, anybody who is protecting us and to storm the Capitol. Um, we know that they were acting in a very organized fashion, but we didn't have all of the specific conversations and communications that took place. And obviously, they tried to guard Between them. Between the Oath Keepers and... And the people... At the top. Now, the, the Department of Justice, it's been reported that they had a strategy of waiting on uh, launching a more aggressive investigation into Donald Trump himself because they wanted to focus on the Oath Keepers and others around him. Right. That has, by all accounts, delayed the process, meaning that it could go post-election. How concerned are you about that? And how do you feel about their strategy to focus on the Oath Keepers first? Well, it seems to me that they've proceeded the way that process prosecutors like to proceed in an organized crime investigation. You start with the smallest fish and then you work your way up. You get them to flip or to testify as to the people who are above them until you get to the very top. Um, and that's how a lot of the godfather prosecutions work. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they were following um, that principle. I mean, the difference here, of course, is that so much of Donald Trump's incitement and coordination of these events took place in plain view. Donald Trump is also calling for an indefinite delay before he goes to trial. His lawyers are, I should say, in the classified documents case. And special counsel Jack Smith's prosecutors argued strongly against any delay. Is there any valid argument for a delay? I don't think that there should be any delay in an existing uh, prosecution. Um, otherwise, um, any criminal defendant in the country would declare for president or Senate or House or mayor and say, you can't prosecute me anymore. You got to wait till next year or the year after. Think of it this way. If some if, if somebody um, uh, is running for office and then is um, implicated in a murder or a rape or an armed robbery, would we say, no, we're going to hold that until after the election, if in the normal course of events it would take place before. He should be treated exactly the way anybody else would be treated in the same situation. There have been hundreds of prosecutions of people um, on the basis of um, crimes that took place on January 6th. Why should he be special? There is some reporting that some of Trump's advisors have been blunt in private conversations, uh, that he is looking to win the election to protect himself by issuing a self-pardon. Yeah. How concerned are you about the precedent, about the legality, about yeah. every aspect of it? As with so many things relating to Donald Trump, it's what we call a case of first impression. Nobody knows because nobody's ever pushed the limits like this before. No president has ever been in a situation where he's had to think about pardoning himself, much less essentially par promising to pardon himself. But. Um, you know, James Madison said in the Federalist Papers that the cardinal principle of justice in our system is that no man may be a judge in his own cause, in his own case. Um, and so it does seem to cut against that very basic principle. Again, he pushes our legal system to the extreme, and we are forced to um, judge these very radical concepts that have never been tested before. Um, but I think there's at least as good an argument that the president cannot pardon himself as the idea that he can. Do you think that's what he's up to? Well, I, I certainly believe that he's trying to use um, he's trying to use his candidacy and his campaign as a shield against legal prosecution. Given Trump hasn't been held accountable yet, it's in process in some ways, and he clearly hasn't changed his behavior much. What concerns you the most about what he could do to subvert the next election? Well, um, a lot of it we're seeing in plain sight right now. There are efforts to change election laws all over the country where um, Trump loyal uh, Republican Party legislative uh, leaders are trying to uh, engage in voter suppression tactics. Um, uh, other efforts to undermine the ability to get a fair count in the election. Um, and, um, you know, we, we saw what they tried to do with the independent state legislature doctrine, which so far has not worked mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court. The idea that the state legislatures essentially can do whatever they want 
with respect to elections. I want to ask you about the work of the Oversight Committee, because you and Congressman Dan Goldman sent a letter to Oversight Chair James Comer this week requesting that he hand over any information he's received from Gal Luft, the man who the GOP claimed, in case people haven't been following this in detail, had evidence of corruption by the Biden family and who was charged with arms trafficking, sanctions violations, and acting as an unregistered agent for China. It's almost like a part of a movie that is happening right now, according to an indictment unsealed this week. What questions, what, what information are you seeking about James Comer's involvement with Luft? And what do you really want to know? Well, look, Gal Luft was supposed to be the star witness in um, arraigning Joe Biden on uh, the old Giuliani charges of uh, a fake Ukrainian bribery scandal. Um, and it turns out that Luft was missing, as uh, Chairman Comer kept saying. The reason he was missing is because he's a fugitive from justice. Uh, he's uh, on the run around the world away from the U.S. government. And this was going to be the star witness against Joe Biden. And what I'm afraid has happened, Jen, is that um, the, the Trump party has created such a topsy-turvy world that we're getting real low-life characters like George Santos, like Donald Trump, like Gal Luft, who say, I think I'm going to be able to launder all of my crimes mm -hmm. and wrap myself in the production they of the Republican Party. They see targets of people they could go after to help them. That's right. And so how concerned are you with that James Comer was the chairman of the committee, was knowingly, unknowingly working with, co-opted by a foreign agent? I'm just concerned that um, the House Oversight Committee, which has a very proud history with you know, Congressman Waxman is chair, uh, the great Elijah Cummings of Maryland is chair, is suddenly being compromised in a really serious way. Our legitimacy is being eroded by the tactics adopted by Chairman Comer. They essentially have said, we will validate anybody who will say anything about the Bidens. And of course, they haven't laid a glove on President Biden. There are real issues that are confronting our people, and they're off on this wild goose chase related to uh, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, and their main witnesses are people who are fleeing justice in America. I wanted to quickly ask you about um, Fox News because there was a defamation lawsuit filed by Ray Epps uh, against Fox News after the network and former host Tucker Carlson repeatedly claimed Epps was an undercover FBI agent who helped provoke the insurrection at the Capitol. Uh, as a constitutional lawyer, yes. an expert, somebody who knows this case deeply, how strong do you think Epps' dex defamation case is? Well, I think it's a very strong case. In the United States of America, which has the First Amendment, it's very hard to prove defamation against someone. Very hard. You've got to prove that they intentionally lied or were so reckless about the truth that they ended up um, essentially disparaging your character in a damaging way. And even with that very strict Nero standard, the Dominion Company was able to win uh, a settlement out of court um, with Fox News. So he saw how Dominion beat Fox News, and he decided, I'm going to do the same thing. They have basically libeled him. They have slandered him. They have defamed him by saying that he would lie about who he was when he was one of their supporters. He's on their side. And that's one of the things that never ceases to amaze me, the way that they turn on their own supporters and devour them. I hope that um, he's you know, not just in it to defeat them legally, but he's in it um, to arrive at a political epiphany about what kind of authoritarian movement he associated with. That is the pathway to redemption for America. Mm -hmm. When people begin to recognize that they were acting like Beijing in Europe and tensions seem to be rising in Asia. House Republicans, seemingly controlled in part by the Freedom Caucus, are playing politics with Pentagon funding. And one Republican senator is holding up crucial military promotions. Things seem to be going great over there. But here's a really important question that many of them seem to be making time to explore. Is Barbie communist? Senator Ted Cruz accusing the new Barbie movie of pushing C. Before Notion, what you found.
CC. Territory in the South China Sea, the so-called Nine Dash Line. So, Joe, is Barbie a communist? Maybe. Is Barbie communist? Maybe. Yes, you heard that right. Apparently, according to Republican Senator Ted Cruz, Barbie's alleged communism, based on a map in a movie, is more offensive than the actions of his colleague Tommy Tuberville who, just to remind you, is on a one-man mission in the Senate to obstruct staffing our military at the highest levels. Right now, back here in the real world, there is no confirmed leader of the U.S. Marine Corps. And guess which division of the military plays a key role in overseeing troops in the South China Sea on the real map? The Marine Corps. No military leader out there is going to tell you they are more worried about a cartoon map in a movie about a doll than about having qualified members of the military in a position to lead their troops. Likewise, no commander will tell you that the biggest problem facing the military is that it's, quote, too woke, despite what House Speaker Kevin McCarthy claims. Just focus on the military. Stop using taxpayer money to do their own wokeism. A military cannot defend themselves if you train them in woke. We don't want Disneyland to train our military. We want our men and women in the military to have every defense possible. And that's what our bill does. To train them in woke. Who knows what that actually even means? McCarthy made those comments after House Republicans passed their version of the defense authorization bill with amendments on abortion, gender transition care, and DEI. It bears repeating on this show nobody really knows what exactly woke means and certainly not what our military leaders are worried about what they are definitely concerned about is the ability of a single senator to block the promotions of more than 270 officers and for pay to be blocked to pay increases to be blocked to military across the country if tuberville continues his hold as many as 650 leadership positions could be vacant by the end of this year according to the pentagon his issue is that he doesn't like the Pentagon's policy of providing time off and reimbursing travel expenses for those seeking reproductive health care. It's not just about abortions. It's also fertility treatments for people trying to conceive a child. Now, it's important to remember that service members and their families don't control where they are posted. They are sent where their skills are most required. That's how it works. That means they could easily find themselves in a state that has restricted access to health care, even when they need it. Pentagon doctors aren't even authorized to perform abortions, except in cases of rape, incest, and if a mother's life is in danger, which, by the way, is law. So for any woman seeking an abortion that does not fall into one of those three categories, she needs to seek health care outside of the Department of Defense. And that means seeking it outside of the state where she is stationed. Another right-wing conspiracy theory is that the U.S. military is a left-wing organization indoctrinating troops with hundreds of hours of DEI training. The actual truth, the right-wing punching bag, diversity and inclusion training, is just one hour, one hour of initial military training for infantry soldiers. And it's during the same period of training time that they spend 160 hours on rifle marksmanship. And it gets better because guess, just guess when the mandatory lunch break length of DEI training was passed into law under President, former President Donald Trump. So just to sum this all up, Republicans led by Senators Tommy Tuberville and Ted Cruz seem to be more concerned about a map in a movie, a fake map in a movie about Barbie, an hour of DEI training and blocking women's access to health care than ensuring our military has confirmed leadership in place during an incredibly tenuous moment around the world. Republicans like Tommy Tuberville love to claim politics and wokeness 
is affecting the readiness of our military committee. Well, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I want to start with something you said, because you said our adversaries are cheering Tuberville on because he's, quote, jeopardizing America's military readiness. We've heard others make this point. Give us some specifics, having served and knowing the national security landscape about what specifically it's putting at risk. Well, I'm a former CIA case officer, and I can just imagine that, be it in Moscow, Tehran, or anywhere else in the world, um, that there are foreign adversary nations and their leadership and their intelligence officers looking at the very reality that one singular senator is able to stop the promotion and the appointment of, at this point, more than 250 members of our military, including the Commandant of the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and that there is no foreseeable end in sight. And by the end of the year, the Pentagon says that that's going to be more than 650 positions. Um, I think that it is real that uh, foreign countries are recognizing that one person can absolutely put to a screeching halt uh, the progression of military careers and importantly, uh, can stop positions, vital positions to our national security from being filled. Now, one of the questions a lot of people who don't know all the functions of Congress have is, how is this even possible for one senator to halt, to so significantly delay these confirmations? I know you've said there could be a workaround, there needs to be a deal struck between Schumer and McConnell. What are the other options and what do you think the most re likely resolution is? So what is typically the case, what is supposed to happen, what has always happened, is that the Senate will bring forth all of these potential promotions. They will pass by unanimous consent, uh, which means they proceed on the floor of the United States Senate uh, without any controversy, because historically it hasn't been controversial that we, the United States Congress, be it members of the United States House or members of the United States Senate, would want uh, military leadership in the positions across the country and across the world that they are needed to serve in. Uh, but Tommy Tuberville is able to stop this process, this unanimous consent process, from moving forward. Um, and that is what is kind of creating this chaos. Um, the reality is, is that he has the ability to stop it tomorrow. He could just stop. Um, these could move forward as unanimous consent, as has been the tradition in the history, and we could go back to having a United States Senate that is focused on ensuring um, our national security. What I want Would to see happen is I want every single Republican senator to tell him to knock it off, to stop it, um, because frankly, while you know, presumably the Senate could vote on every single promotion, the reality that that would be the workaround because indeed one senator is standing in the way of our military readiness, um, the fact that we even have to consider what workarounds exist because of Senator Tuberville is in and of itself pretty shameful and ridiculous. Would, would you be for getting rid of this requirement that for promotions need to be approved through the Senate, um, which, is, which is part of the holdup and we could be in this cycle again, unfortunately? I mean, I think the... I mean, I think the, the reality is if you look at the tradition and the background of what's occurred, it's been that they move before the United States Senate, there's unanimous consent, they move forward, because having leadership in our you know, top ranks of the military previously hasn't been a political, politicized, or partisan issue. If the United States Senate, or in particular one senator, is going to stand in the way of uh, having military leadership in the positions where they are needed um, as, a, on a, on a, as a regular obstructionist activity, then yes, perhaps we need to reevaluate uh, the whole process. But the reality is the process shouldn't have to change because there is one man who is behaving so egregiously poorly mm -hmm. 
Um, I, you know, I, I represent Quantico. I represent tens of thousands of military uh, current active duty service members and veterans. I was in Prince William County in my district yesterday. Uh, and when speaking to a crowd, I said, how many of you are Marines? You know, how many of you are veterans? And half the room in that county uh, raised their hands. And I said, this is where we are right now. The reality is there's no commandant of the United States Marine Corps. And the number of people who spoke to me afterwards and said, I cannot imagine what it would have been like to serve in the Marine Corps. Many of them served in active duty positions in active war zones, um, in infantry positions. What would it have been like to serve in the United States Marine Corps knowing that there was no commandant, that there was no leadership because of one United States Senator? It's creating a it's politicizing the military in a way that is dangerous um, and it to CRT, critical race theory, which rapidly turned our education system into the front line of the right's ongoing culture war. That anger no doubt sparked the rise of organizations now focused on taking over school boards, pulling books from the shelves and changing curriculums in schools across the country. In fact, According to a 2022 report from a nonprofit that tracks censorship in America, 70% of those organizations were formed in about an 18 month period, beginning at the start of 2021. Among the largest of these new groups, which you may have heard of, is Moms for Liberty. And it's recently become something of a political powerhouse. Just a few weeks ago, they hosted five Republican presidential candidates, including the front runners, Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. They all came out for Moms for Liberty. Now, the group has declared itself as a nonpartisan organization, and its name does sound innocuous enough. Moms, great, sounds good. Liberty, awesome, who doesn't like liberty? Moms for liberty. As the mom of two young kids, that even sounds good to me. But it's vague enough that even some of its own members are pretty unclear as to what the group is really all about, what, what they're a part of. One mom who became treasurer of an Indiana chapter was even quoted asking, what am I a part of? I need to know these things. Fair question. Well, I'm here to help. I'm here to help you. Because as benign as Moms for Liberty may sound, its agenda is unmistakably extreme. For instance, you may not know that Moms for Liberty has been helping to lead the movement in pulling books from the library shelves, including classics like The Bluest Eye, Great Book, The Kite Runner, Amazing Book, and Mouse, all, as well as other books that deal with race, diversity, and sexuality. The group has turned school board meetings into unruly shouting matches. As an attendee at one Florida meeting described, quote, they turn around and scream at me that I am a commie and teachers want to see all kids fail. This group brings out the worst in people. The group says this work, all of this shouting, is the work of joyful warriors is what they call it. Sounds a lot more to me like pretty aggressive harassment. And that behavior is not isolated. It's part of a bigger pattern. Chapters and members across the country have led campaigns targeting community active advocates, school board members, and opposing groups. They have repeatedly sent intimidating messages, openly threatened officials, and even baselessly leveled charges of child abuse and sympathizing with pedophilia. Unbelievably, an Indiana chapter even put out a newsletter that quoted Adolf Hitler saying, quote, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. That is a Hitler quote. And while they eventually apologized, the organization seemed to later regret that a concern nonpartisan moms who happen to care about liberty. Consider this. One of the founders, whose name is notably omitted from its website, is a current Republican school board member who is married to the now chairman of the Florida Republican Party. In 2021, he told the Washington Post, quote, I have been trying for a dozen years to get 20 and 30 year old females involved with the Republican Party. But now Moms for Liberty has done it for me. Sounds pretty apolitical. So below the surface of their sending friendly sounding name and politically vague taglines, they are an unapologetically extreme organization that has built a long record of harassment and controversy in a pretty short period of time. Some free advice out there for people who are not sure what their organization is about, whether it's called Moms for Liberty or Puppies for Ice Cream. It's worth looking into the thing or seeing a headline about the expected merger between the PGA Tour and the Saudi Back Live Golf League. If you're not a golf fan, and frankly, with everything else going on in the world, it may seem like an easy story to just brush through and ignore. But here's why you shouldn't. If Saudi Arabia, through its public investment fund, is able to essentially 
actually purchase professional golf, it would mean that a country with vast wealth and a very troubling record on human rights could potentially clean up its image through its sports ownership. In a hearing earlier this week, Senator Richard Blumenthal summed up the stakes this way. Today's hearing is about much more than the game of golf. It's about how a brutal, repressive regime can buy influence, indeed even take over a cherished American institution to cleanse its public image. It's a regime that has reportedly killed journalists, jailed and tortured dissidents, fostered the war in Yemen, and supported other terrorist activities, including the 9-11 attack on our nation. Today is about sports washing. Joining me now, and I'm thrilled about this, is Sally Jenkins. She's a sports columnist for The Washington Post and the author of the new book, The Right Call, What Sports Teaches Us, uh, te what sports teach us About Work and Life. So, Sally, I want to start. You, you recently wrote a column about the merger and the next steps here. Is there anything you think could stop this deal from going through, or is it just, is it going to happen? Uh, I'm not at all convinced it's going to go through. The Department of Justice is already showing pretty intense interest in it to the point that uh, the two parties, the Saudis and the PGA Tour, dropped uh, one key provision of the framework agreement that they had signed. Also, I would not be surprised to see uh, some sort of major revolt by the PGA Tour players and mm. other board of directors. One director has already stepped down in protest. The strange thing about this deal was that three members of the PGA Tour policy board, uh, two members plus the commissioner, were able to do this deal in uh, some kind of London smoke-filled room with the Saudis yeah, without behind closed anybody doors. else's uh, knowledge of the deal. Completely. It's a very strange deal with it bears a lot of examination. I think we're only just getting started. Now, you mentioned that players are in a pretty difficult position here, and I know you talked to a number of them because they aren't exactly experts on the complicated relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. They're kind of put in a position unwittingly often to defend Saudi Arabia. How difficult are you hearing that is for them, and how are they navigating these tough questions? Well, first, there are two different issues for the players. The first one is just the serious governance questions that are raised by the fact that this deal could be signed by members of their policy board without their knowledge. That's number mm -hmm. one. But number two is, yes, it creates incredible endorsement complications for, for a number of them. Uh, it also, the, the deal begs the question, is this really good for the players? Because it's anti-competitive. Uh, you know, it appears to be narrowing the options for the players rather than expanding them. Less competition is not good for the players. So there's a real question whether this deal only benefits three or four executives as opposed to the PGA Tour membership. Well, Rory McIlroy, one, one of the best players in golf, uh, said this week, quote, if Live Golf was the last place to play golf on earth, I would retire. That's how I feel about it. I'd play the majors, but I'd be pretty comfortable not playing. Are, are you hearing that sentiment from others? And what kind of impact could it have on the type of high-level players who could be lost from the sport of golf or retire? I, I actually believe that you have not heard the last or even the first from the players. Tiger Woods, his silence has been enormous. Until anybody knows Tiger Woods' position on this, there's no guarantee that any deal goes through. Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods have the ability to take the entire PGA Tour with them if they choose to dig in and refuse this deal and seek some other deal. One of the strangest things about this agreement is that the PGA Tour acknowledged in Senator Blumenthal's very critical hearing that they did not seek any advice, they did not seek any other funding, they did not seek any other options to this deal. Uh, presumably there are options and the players I think will want to know about that before they sign on to something that was presented to them after total secrecy. Seem, seems fair. Now, Saudi Arabia has owned um, other sports teams, including Newcastle United Football Club in the UK, uh, and the Sovereign Fund took over control of soccer clubs in the, in the kingdom as well. Where else do you see, I mean, some of it may depend on what happens with the DOJ, but where else do you see them trying to invest and trying to buy sports teams to help their image? 
Well, Formula One is an obvious target. They're mm. beginning to initiate talks with ATP Tennis, the, the men's tennis tour. But, you know, there's a distinction here. It's one thing for the Saudis to invest in a sport or a business. They have money in Uber. They have money in, you know, the, the Saudi investment fund is $700 billion. They have to invest somewhere. There's a difference between that and lock, stock and barrel owning something 100%. Mm -hmm. Most reasonable American businesses limit sovereign government investment in their companies to around 20%. Mm -hmm. The NBA is, is doing that. The, the Adam Silver of the NBA has said that the Saudis or any other sovereign government fund cannot buy more than 20% of the team. It's a reasonable rule. It protects American interests and American security. Why the PGA Tour is doing this deal as opposed to one of those is one of the largest questions in this issue. My